Bacon. He stuck right to those two terms that he wants to use. His condition is good and stable, and he would not go beyond that. And in, in effect confirming that there has been open chest surgery, but not open heart surgery. Yeah, I don't know where that rumor started about the uh, open heart surgery because it was fairly well established quite early on, I believe, that uh, the bullet had actually missed the president's heart by uh, one inch or so, and that there had been no damage to his heart, but that the damage was to his lung. Frank Michael Reagan, who is the president's uh, oldest son, uh, is in Sherman Oaks, California, a short while ago. He spoke to reporters, and we have videotape of that statement now. He had just received information from the East Coast. I have heard from the from the people in Washington that I talked to that he's out of surgery, that he's in good condition. Nancy has been told he's in good condition, and that he will uh, be in probably intensive care for a while, and uh, then he will get on with the business of this country, and uh, changing some of the problems we have and making it a better place to live. And my father's a strong person, and he's in good shape, and he's going to pull through this tough time and just uh, put it in the back of his mind and. Probably go out to the ranch the end of April and cut some firewood, go to my sister's wedding, and run the country. Well, I hope he's right. I hope he's right. And it certainly yeah. sounds as though he yes, is, and everything we're hearing right now is very, very encouraging, and uh, that is that the president, uh, what, is within, uh, well, let's see, Lynn Lopsig has said he would be coming out of shortly. surgery shortly, that his condition is good and stable. What you just heard from the president's oldest son, Mike Reagan, confirms all of that. He's getting the same information, uh, and uh, you even heard a, a very optimistic prediction that he'll be out cutting firewood at his ranch in California by the end of April. May it be so. He likes to do that, and uh, probably, uh, I suppose, a 70-year-old man is able to withstand what must be of an actual shock of uh, surgery, and certainly of being shot. Uh, for being in better physical condition. Although I was, I was fascinated by what Dr. DeMayo, the uh, former medical examiner in New York, had to say. He said it didn't make any difference that he's 70 years old, that uh, the age has absolutely nothing to do with it. He was much more concerned that that... And you know what interests me? He kept emphasizing the small caliber bullet. Now, yeah. I, I would have assumed that a large caliber bullet would do more damage. But in both the president's case and in the case of Press Secretary Jim Brady, uh, the doctor, Dr. DeMeo, was emphasizing the potential danger of the small caliber bullet, uh, which can apparently do so much damage as it's moving around inside the, uh, the body. Presumably, why? Because it doesn't explode? I don't know. That's... No, it doesn't explode. I mean, that's, uh, that's the dum-dum kind that uh, was supposedly outlawed many, many years ago. I have some knowledge of those. Uh, it is now 622 in uh, Washington, D.C. The President of the United States has been in surgery since shortly before 4 o'clock. I gather since shortly before 4 o'clock, more than two hours. The word that we get, however, the unofficial word, is uh, that his condition is uh, good uh, and stable. He will be out of surgery shortly. And as Lynn Nofziger said, uh, in due course, they will have a doctor who will come out and brief reporters there at George Washington University Hospital. The uh, same cheerful uh, prognosis or optimistic prognosis cannot uh, at this point be made in the case of Mr. James Brady, who is the president's uh, press secretary, who uh, remains in uh, seriously uh, serious condition, very critical condition as a matter of fact. He was uh, the victim of a, uh, of a head wound, whereas the president was shot on the uh, left side. The bullet entered his left under his arm, according to uh, Lynn Nofziger some time ago. And apparently that's that's the situation uh, did not hit his heart did puncture the lung which immediately uh, collapsed and he's been in surgery now for more than two hours but the word we get from people who were there at the hospital is that uh, things look good what a day for the president what a day. yes um, for the president. incidentally those those earlier reports that uh, Jim Brady was dead uh, those those came about because we got those reports from a spokesman for uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker and also a uh, White House aide who made those reports earlier. They were erroneous, uh, happy to say, but again, uh, Mr. Brady is in very serious condition at uh, George Washington Hospital. There are two other people who were uh, hit by bullets earlier today. Uh, a Secret Service agent whose condition is said to be, what's the official word on his condition? Good, uh, I'm stable, I'm okay. the Secret Service agent. Uh, I'm told that it was good. Good, and uh, presumably also on the, uh, the District of Columbia police officer. But of course, understandably, the primary focus of attention 
has been on President Reagan, uh, who was coming out uh, after having made a speech to uh, a branch of the AFL-CIO here in Washington at the Hilton Hotel earlier this afternoon. And as he was coming out, and apparently as he was coming over to uh, uh, respond to questions from waiting reporters, uh, there was the outburst of gunfire. We later found out from a 22 caliber pistol. Uh, within seconds, quite literally, the man who apparently had done the shooting uh, was literally swarmed over by a number of Secret Service agents and police agents. The president, uh, there was no indication at that time that the president had been hit. The president was thrust into his limousine and they drove, up, uh, drove away very quickly. In fact, when the first reports came out that he had gone to George Washington Hospital, yes. our assumption was that he had gone to visit uh, Jim Brady and the, and the other two to find out what had happened to them. But then yes. later we learned that the president himself had been hit by gunfire. And it was, uh, uh, Ted, excuse me, it was more than an assumption. We were told by officials that the president was all right, the president was okay, the president had not been hit. Uh, these were officials who were not there at the hospital, you know, uh, they were at the White House. And as a matter of fact, when I was handed the bulletin saying that the president had been hit, I misread it. Uh, that word first came from Lynn Nofziger, and I, uh, I just assumed that, I mean, I made the, just didn't, my eyes didn't connect, you know, with the word president was wounded. The world reaction is what you might expect. Uh, naturally, world leaders all around the globe are conveying their shock and dismay. In uh, Moscow, according to, this, uh, according to this report that I have here, the uh, shooting was given runner-up mention on Moscow radio behind a report that two cosmonauts had returned to Earth. The Soviet news agency TASS moved a nine-line story on the assassination attempt 75 minutes after the news was flashed elsewhere. Well, they always take their time. Uh, Secretary General of all time expressed shock and dismay, condemned this act of terrorism. King of Spain telephoned the White House immediately, and the Prime Minister also sent a telegram. West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who spoke to the President earlier today, he called uh, Giscard d'Estaing, and he also called the President, and the White House had issued a statement saying that the President and uh, the Chancellor had agreed that in the event of internal suppression of the Polish people, that uh, there would be no economic aid to Poland. In fact, just a few hours ago, that was precisely the issue that reporters oh, wanted yes. to discuss with the president. Yes. So it was amazing how some of the, uh, the major news of the day can be pushed to the back burner when something like this happens. We have a piece of videotape that was done a few hours ago uh, in which the deputy chief of police here in the District of Columbia, John Connor, was briefing reporters on the scene of the shooting. I should emphasize that he himself was not an eyewitness. Here's Deputy Police Chief John Connor. Fired several shots. Mr. Brady, the press secretary, was struck. One Secret Service agent, one Metropolitan Police agent officer was struck. I don't, I don't know which one was hit first. All of them been taken to the hospital. There are reports that the president has also been, been, uh, was hit with by one of the rounds. I don't uh, know the, the uh, extent of that injury. He's been taken to the hospital for treatment. Uh, they have one. That was Deputy Police Chief uh, John Connor of uh, the District of Columbia reporting, uh, briefing reporters at the scene of the shooting. Shortly after it happened, he was not actually not an eyewitness. Just to bring you up to date once again, it is now 6.27 or so here in Washington, D.C. The president is still in surgery. However, we understand that he will be coming out shortly. Uh, and the prognosis, uh, while it's not been officially declared by the doctors, uh, nevertheless, we are told that uh, the outlook is very favorable. Uh, Senator Baker has said that he has been told by Senator Laxalt, who was at the hospital, that the doctors uh, consider the president to be in very, very good condition, despite the fact that he was wounded this afternoon in that assassination attempt. Frank, before yeah. you do what you're going to do, just uh, one quick word on the condition of that D.C. policeman, Thomas K. Delahanty, 45 years old. He is said to be in serious condition at Washington Hospital Center. He's in the intensive care unit. The bullet entered the back of his left shoulder. It is lodged in the left side of his neck. He is under observation, no operation yet, 17-year veteran of the police department with the 3rd District K-9 unit. Uh, so there now we have uh, the fourth man about, we, about whom we have heard the least. This again is the uh, D.C. policeman, Thomas K. Delahanty. He is in serious condition. And the earlier word we had on uh, Timothy McCarthy was that uh, he was in good condition. That's the Secret Service. Secret Service agent. 
who was also wounded. Well, this is the time of evening when uh, many parts of the country, people are uh, watching the network news uh, telecast. Of course, we're, we're not putting on that kind of a broadcast tonight because we're concentrating on the number one story that naturally has preoccupied us all. But I do want to go abroad now uh, to our foreign desk in London and uh, to Peter Jennings, who will bring us up to date uh, very quickly on other world news. And there have been many, many major and important stories uh, happening around the globe today not connected with this incident here in Washington. Peter? In other news overseas today, the Polish government and the independent unions have stepped back from the brink. There will be no national strike tomorrow, and we'll have a report. In Thailand tonight, the end of a hijack in an outburst of violence. Thai and Indonesian commandos storm that Indonesian jetliner which has been sitting at Bangkok Airport. ABC's Mark Litke has details. For a third tense day, Thai authorities had kept the Muslim terrorists holding the Garuda Airlines jet distracted. Negotiations continued to meet their demand that 80 political prisoners be flown from Indonesia, and publicly the Thai Prime Minister turned down an Indonesian request to storm the plane with their own commandos secretly flown into Bangkok. But throughout the day, as Thai troops moved in closer to the DC-9, rumors persisted that the Indonesian government would get its way. And it did. Shortly after 2.30 a.m. Bangkok time, heavily armed Indonesian and Thai commandos moved in with ladders and stormed the jet. The shooting lasted for several minutes as commandos blasted through the doors, killing some of the terrorists, forcing survivors into the open. Passengers fled through emergency exits, met by a coordinated arrival of emergency vehicles. Those wounded in the hail of gunfire were taken to a nearby military hospital. The Thai command said the situation was under control within two minutes, the casualty figures remarkably low. Tonight, those who had counseled against giving in to the demands of the hijackers feel they've won an important victory against terrorism. Mark Litke, ABC News, Bangkok. And now Poland. When the television news there came on tonight, the sigh of relief internationally was almost audible. The independent union Solidarity and the government have worked out a compromise. Solidarity has postponed the national strike which it had planned to hold tomorrow. It's not altogether clear what compromise means. It's equally unclear whether the Communist Party and the more militant union members will be happy with the deal. In Warsaw, here's ABC's Jerry King. Lech Wałęsa told the PACT news conference he was satisfied with 70% of the agreement. It would appear Solidarity accepted what amounted to government promises of discussions and investigations rather than anything concrete. Wałęsa wants to put the decision on whether or not to cancel altogether the current strike alert to the union's national coordinating committee, the representatives from all over the country. Their acquiescence is not automatic, but such was the national relief here today. It's doubtful they would vote to carry out the strike now. Now, both sides knew today was it, a last-ditch effort to avoid the inevitability of what everyone called the catastrophe of a general strike. In essence, these talks between Solidarity and the government had a greater sense of urgency after apparently neither the hardliners nor the moderates won the power struggle at the Communist Party's meeting of the Central Committee, which ended earlier this morning. All day, there were official hints Solidarity and the government were drawing closer together, and as the meeting broke up, Valencia's supporters chanted and sang Poland's version of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow, May You Live a Hundred Years. All this, of course, does not mean Poland is out of the woods, but it has at least bought a little time, and there seems to be a new constructive atmosphere. What has happened here, perhaps more than anything else, has been a movement toward a more realistic approach. The realization that the two sides may indeed have been heading toward the kind of self-destruction the Communist Party has warned of. The realization that Poland and all Polish people would be the big losers. Jerry King, ABC News, Warsaw. That, of course, is the other news of the day. Uh, we would normally be right in the middle of world news tonight for uh, many of the uh, affiliates that uh, carry this broadcast. Uh, we are not because we are and have been since early this afternoon covering live the events relating to the shooting which involved President Reagan. Uh, he was hit by a bullet, has been in surgery for the better part of two and a half hours now. Uh, our last information was that his condition is good and stable, that he is expected to recover, uh, but also our last word was that he was still in surgery. Uh, then there is the case of Jim Brady, the White House press secretary. He was uh, hit in the head by a same small caliber bullet his condition is not as good. His condition is said to be grave. 
Uh, and then there are the uh, then there are the uh, Secret Service agent Timothy McCarthy, whose condition is said to be good, and Thomas K. Delahanty, a 45-year-old D.C. policeman. He is in serious condition. Four men who were shot this afternoon. Vice President Bush, I'm told, has just landed here in Washington. He was uh, engaged in a, uh, uh, a speaking uh, appointment in Texas. As soon as he heard the information, uh, uh, the first word was that the president had not been hit by a bullet, so there was some question as to whether the vice president would come back. Uh, but then word reached the vice president on a refueling stop in Austin that the president had been hit, and he came back. Again, we realize that many of you who have seen the tape we're now about to show you many times if you've been with us over the afternoon, but also many of you have not. Here it is, the president emerging from a speaking engagement at the Washington uh, Hotel earlier this afternoon. And any second now, the shots will begin. There. That cluster of bodies, policemen, Secret Service agents, and they have, under that pile of bodies, the man who is accused of the shooting, John W. Hinckley, believed to be in his early 20s. And in that brief scattering of gunshots, and in those few seconds, the president was hit, his press secretary was hit, a Secret Service agent was hit, and a DC policeman was hit. And at the time, because the president was immediately pushed into his limousine and sped away, it was believed, there's Jim Brady lying on the ground, it was believed that the president had not been hit. And subsequently, we were told that he had not returned to the White House, but had gone to the hospital. And again, the information was that the president had gone to the hospital out of solicitude for those who had been uh, actually injured. And then came the announcement. Now, oh, goodness. momentarily, Frank, we will see uh, Hinckley being bodily carried by the Secret Service and police uh, to a police car. Hinckley, we're now told, is 25 years old. He is currently being held at D.C. police headquarters. He's been interrogated already by the uh, Secret Service. You'll just see the top of his head in a moment as he is carried face down toward a police car. President Reagan, I'm told, is still in surgery. There is now a report that uh, he will be in there until about 7 p.m. Eastern time, which would be 25 minutes from now. That would mean that he actually will be in about uh, three hours, so somewhat in excess of that. There again, you see in the foreground Jim Brady, and uh, the, uh, the body that you see lying in the back there belongs to Secret Service uh, agent Timothy McCarthy. He is now in good condition. Mr. Brady is not. Here they go with us. Now there you just saw the top of uh, Hinckley's head. Can't really see him. Uh, he's face down there. Just now they're going to take him to another car. This is a videotape, we must remind you. It's not happening now. It happened uh, shortly after 2.30 this afternoon. We can get a look, though, at the man that they do have in custody. We have a couple of pictures of him, uh, one of his high school uh, graduation. We understand this was taken in 1972, is that right? John Warnock Hinckley. He is 25 years old. There is a college yearbook picture. Where did he go to college? I didn't have any information before that uh, he had uh, he's gone. He went on to, he went to Texas Tech. Well, I, I have a feeling, Frank. That's his driver's license picture, yeah. and I have a feeling we're going to be finding out everything about this young man uh, that uh, can possibly be gathered. This particular picture was taken this year, 1981. Yes. We have a report from our Dallas affiliate, WFAA, reporting, uh, and I, not, well, I don't know the source of that information, but I'm sure that if they, they're reporting it, they're sure of it, that uh, it's believed that Hinckley bought two 22 caliber handguns in October, October 13th of uh, last year, 1980, was before the election, for $47 each at a Dallas pawn shop called Rocky's Pawn Shop. In Dallas. Of all cities. Yes, right? of all cities. Although the gun that was used in Dallas was not purchased in Dallas, uh, if you recall. That was purchased from a mail-order house in Chicago. 
And it should be pointed out before we get into the handgun controversy, and that undoubtedly is going to come up in the in the days and weeks ahead, that that particular gun, of course, was not a handgun. That was a rifle. Yes. Uh, this information, was, though. This was. But this uh, information being handed again, we pointed out that uh, Mr. Hinckley had gone to Texas Tech. Apparently, he attended Texas Tech for just one semester in 1973. He is now being held at D.C. Police Headquarters. Just to bring you up to date once again on where everybody is right now, the president uh, is still in surgery, expected to be in surgery for a few more minutes. He's been there since about 4 o'clock Eastern time, in other words, almost three hours in surgery. Uh, Mr. Brady, uh, the president's press secretary, has also been in surgery. Uh, the prognosis for him is not very good. In fact, uh, earlier this afternoon, we showed you a videotape of Ross Simpson, a uh, mutual reporter, who had spoken to one of the doctors on the floor uh, where both the uh, both the president and the uh, and the press secretary were brought and this doctor said the prognosis for Jim Brady and I emphasize this is the press secretary the prognosis for him is not good but few people survive such a wound but there had been reports earlier today that Mr. Brady had already died that is not true he is still undergoing surgery but he is in very bad condition and we should expect a uh, word uh well, I assume as quickly as the president is uh, taken out of surgery, we ought to get the information that that is has in fact uh, happened. He's been in there now. I keep looking beyond you. You'll excuse me because a big clock on the uh, the proverbial clock on the studio wall, Ken, uh, up there, and it's uh, 20 minutes to seven at this time. Uh, many of you would be uh, seeing the world news tonight. My colleague Max Robinson, uh, unfortunately, is ill, so he can't join us in the coverage of. Uh, this, uh, this event today. We're going to go now to Susan King, who was at the White House, and may have some late information. Susan? Well, Frank, I really don't have any latest information. It has been just about an hour since we were briefed here officially, and then it was just a very short and a very terse statement by Assistant Press Secretary Larry Speaks, who said simply, the president remains in surgery at that time, and he said the reports about Jim Brady are untrue. It was very terse. He would not take any questions. What is going on here at the White House right now is really uh, an attempt to get things organized. Uh, Jim Baker, who is, of course, the uh, chief of staff, has returned from the hospital and is, in, is here now in the situ situation room, as are most of the top deputies here at the White House. Calls to the many offices show that they are here. Also here are uh, Vice President Bush's uh, chief of staff and his press secretary. There are numerous um, cabinet members here at the situation also. However, questions about whether there would be a cabinet meeting were uh, answered with no, no cabinet meeting. They're just all the players are here in the event of anything. About uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, we did hear from Secretary of State Haig, who came in here with National Security Advisor Richard Allen. Haig was the only one to do the talking, and he said, I am in charge right now. We are awaiting the Vice President. We, the networks, have requested uh, the opportunity to film the vice president or tape the vice president as he arrives on the White House lawn. He will be coming right here to the Situation Room, but they were denied. At this point, they are trying to get things organized, as I said, and try to quell any rumors that, of course, in any situation like this begin to erupt. The White House press office is really stunned. The man who has led them and organized them in this very short two months is in very serious condition. But part of the staff is trying to operate out of here, and part of the staff is now going over to the hospital where they will try to set up an auxiliary and perhaps the top briefing area, at least top briefing area in terms of the president's health. What they're trying to do is inform both of us at the same time. It is very calm here. People are staying organized. I talked to some people in the congressional office. You know, at the White House, they still have to do things like this. They had to call various members of Congress who were supposed to come meet with the president tomorrow and tell them that meeting has been canceled. Uh, the Congressional Liaison Office says essentially they're taking day by day and they are not informing people beyond that. But they had to call and just go through the, uh, uh, the normal channels and say because of the situation the President will be able to meet tomorrow. Things are very calm here. However, we're all of course, searching for the information when the President comes out of surgery and we get a report on it. But we're not expecting that for about another um, perhaps a half hour. Frank? Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Uh, Ted, you know uh, the Senate this afternoon uh, when the word came in, uh, Senator Baker uh, said uh, there were unconfirmed reports that the president had been shot and that the, uh, the Senate was going to go into recess until he could uh, find out more about it. And at that point, we were all reporting, you know, that the president had not been shot, that uh, the president had escaped injury. Uh, Sam and I, Sam was sitting there, Sam Donaldson, where you are, 
and Sam was there and witnessed it. I mean, he was standing right next to Hank Brown, the cameraman, at the videotaping of the actual shooting. And of course, even as, even as you look at the tape, it, uh, I mean, now with hindsight, oh, we yes. can we can tell, I suppose. But you could look at that tape, and it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, to know that the president had been shot. Sam made the point, uh, you know, and I, I stressed it too that uh, the president had been manhandled, that he'd been uh, seized by the Secret Service agents who uh, may not even have known at that point, you know, that he'd been hit. And uh, naturally, their first inclination was to protect him, to shield him from further harm, uh, or and against get him in that car. Though. Get him in the car and get him out of there. And so we were talking about how he had been jostled, and uh, Sam said he had, he had been bumped against the side of the car. You could see that the president was, you know, he hit part of the framework of the automobile as he was... Uh, uh, literally uh, just pushed into it. Do uh, you remember what they, how they handled uh, Jerry Ford in both those incidents? They well, just as, grabbed a, him. as a matter of fact, I was about to make the observation that unfortunately uh, anyone over the age of 15 in this country uh, is, is all too familiar with this kind of an attempt on the president's life. Uh, not just this president, it, it has happened all too many times before. And our legal correspondent, Tim O'Brien, is going to take a look back now at some of these other recent attempts on the president's life. Before today, Gerald Ford was the most recent American president to become the target of a serious assassination attempt. It happened twice in September of 1975. On the 5th, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, a Charles Manson follower, aimed a pistol at President Ford, but it was grabbed by a Secret Service agent before she could fire it. September 22nd, Sarah Jane Moore, a political activist, did manage to get off a shot at Mr. Ford, but she missed. Both women were convicted of attempted assassination of a president and are now serving life terms in prison. In each case, security was tight, as it had been around every president since the assassination of President John Kennedy, November 22nd, 1963. Sometimes even tight security isn't enough, though. A political figure is exceptionally vulnerable during a campaign. Bobby Kennedy shot and killed in 1968 during a victory celebration in Los Angeles. George Wallace shot at a shopping center in Maryland in 1972, crippled for life. And Martin Luther King killed during a campaign of a different sort, Memphis, 1968. While all these shootings occurred at a particularly traumatic time in American life, they are not without grim precedent. November 1950, two Puerto Rican nationalists tried to invade Blair House to assassinate President Truman. A Secret Service guard was killed, but Truman was unhurt. In fact, he kept all his appointments that day, commenting, a president has to expect those things. Two weeks before Franklin Roosevelt became president, a mentally ill bricklayer took a shot at him, but a bystander grabbed the assassin's arm. The bullet missed Roosevelt, but fatally wounded Chicago Mayor Anton Chernak. 1901, William McKinley was shot to death by an anarchist who professed a desire to kill a great ruler. 20 years earlier, 1881, James Garfield. 1865, Abraham Lincoln. And in all of these cases, the assassin or the would-be assassin used a rifle or a handgun. Tim O'Brien, ABC News, New York. Thank you, Tim. We have been told, uh, the Secret Service has told ABC News that the uh, alleged assailant, uh, John Warnock Hinckley, was arrested once before. We had earlier been given to understand that they had not discovered any uh, record of any uh, prior arrests but apparently that is uh, not the case and they've discovered now that he was arrested once before for what uh, on what grounds we don't know and we don't know what the charge was or what the offense uh, was supposed to be a short while ago the president's older brother neil reagan talked with reporters yeah. in uh, san diego uh, california where he happens to be at the moment and he was asked whether he and his brother the president had ever discussed the risks uh, involved in being president, the possibility that something like this might happen is what he had to say. This is Neil Reagan. Okay. Talked with your brother about the dangers uh, associated with the job and had a conversation with him at all about. Uh... No, those conversations were were with my wife. I was almost sure it would happen. You say you were almost sure it would happen. Sure. Why is that, sir? Isn't that the tenor of the country at the, uh, in the last several years? Huh? I, you know, if you're going to kill a man, his wife, and three little kids out here, as was done over this weekend here in the San Diego area, why not go for big game? Well, that was Neil Reagan. That's the uh, older brother of the president. And as you can see, more in sorrow than in anger, uh, talking about the inevitability, at least in his mind, of this kind of thing happening speaking again of the climate of violence that, that seems to be so prevalent in this country today. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure where we're supposed to be going right now, but I think uh, well, we I have think a report. Well, I think the best thing we'd better do, because we've been away for just a few moments, is remind you once again that President Reagan is still in surgery. We, he's expected to uh, be uh, removed from the operating room very shortly. Uh, we have had unofficial word that the operation to uh, remove the bullet that struck him this afternoon in the left side of the chest uh, has been successful and that uh, the president is in good condition. The outlook is said to be very favorable, but that is uh, unofficial word uh, relayed from one member of uh, the Senate, Senator Laxalt, to Senator Baker. Uh, Senator Baker on Capitol Hill relaying that word uh, to various reporters up there, including Frank, ours. let me just yes. add that Vice President Bush, uh, who was in Texas earlier today, is not only back here in Washington, he is now over at the hospital and presumably standing by with the first family or members of the first family to find out what the president's condition is as quickly as possible. We do have a report now from our diplomatic correspondent, Barry Dunsmore, and let's go to that report right now. Secretary of State Haig stressed that he and senior members of the cabinet had gathered quickly at the White House. He also stressed the point that absolutely no alert measures were necessary or contemplated. Haig then went on to note his interpretation of who is now in charge. Constitutionally, gentlemen, you have the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state in that order. And should the president decide he wants to tr transfer the helm, to the vice president, he, he will do so. As of now, I am in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president, and in, in close touch with him. If something came up, I would check with him, of course. In fact, while Haig is the number three man in the executive branch, he is not the second in succession. After the vice president comes the Speaker of the House, followed by the President Pro Tem of the Senate, and then the Secretary of State. If Ronald Reagan is seriously incapacitated, the vice president can be made acting president if a majority of the cabinet certifies in a written declaration to the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem of the Senate that the president is unable to discharge his duties. For the moment, there is no indication that such an action is being considered. Barry Dunsmore, ABC News, the State Department. Hold, hold on, Thank you, Barry. just one minute. There certainly is no indication that any action of that uh, kind is being considered. Uh, the country, the cabinet, uh, the world waiting now for word from the doctors at George Washington University Hospital here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the surgery that uh, has been performed on the president uh, this afternoon. Uh, we understand that the uh, exploratory surgery uh, first uh, concentrated on the abdominal area in order probably, as Dr. DeMaio of uh, New York told us a short while ago, Ted, uh, to determine whether any vital organs had also been uh, struck by the uh, bullet, a 22 caliber bullet and then uh, open chest surgery. Uh, naturally, any surgery in the chest is open chest surgery. I guess that it would be characterized that way. That somehow gave rise to a rumor that swept around, uh, apparently, that the president had undergone open heart surgery. That's not the case at all. But as we <coughs> must say, and as we are very uh, pleased to be able to say, the uh, outlook for the president, according to the unofficial reports we've had from the hospital, is uh, quite favorable. The same cannot be said for Jim Brady, the president's press secretary, who was uh, wounded in the head uh, this afternoon at the time of the uh, shooting. Uh, the other two uh, uh, officers who were wounded, one Secret Service agent, is said to be uh, in good condition, and the police officer, however, the District of Columbia police officer, uh, the outlook for him is not quite so favorable. He's said to be in uh, a rather serious condition. Sam Donaldson is at George Washington University Hospital now, and we'll go to him. Sam, Keep go ahead. Seven, Sam? I don't well, know. Frank, uh, we're here in a jury-rigged uh, press room here in George Washington uh, University Hospital in Washington, a conference room, and we're waiting for another medical advisory, which we uh, are told will come sometime around 7 o'clock Eastern time. The last one we had said that President Reagan was uh, still in surgery. He went in surgery uh, shortly before 4 o'clock uh, for removal of the bullet, presumably, and for repair of whatever damage may have been done to uh, his left chest. We don't know, of course, the extent of his injury, although all the reports that we receive here uh, say that he is doing well, that uh, he is doing well. And there is no uh, negative report, to, uh, fortunately, um, to counter that. But we have no uh, word that he has actually uh, been released from the surgery uh, or that uh, the uh, completion of it uh, 
uh, suggests that uh, he is completely out of danger. His condition has simply been called guarded and stable here. Lynn Nossiger, his longtime assistant and uh, personal friend who's been with him since the uh, mid-60s, has been doing the briefing here. Uh, Lynn said to us a few uh, minutes ago, maybe about 30 minutes ago, that he too uh, would confirm that the president was doing well, but he uh, would not go beyond that. He uh, said he had no report on James Brady, the press secretary, except that at that time, uh, as of about 30 or 40 minutes ago, he was in surgery. Of course, Nancy Reagan is here with her husband at the hospital. And she came shortly after he was uh, brought here about 2.30 uh, this afternoon. Um, the atmosphere here, as you can see from uh, your uh, section of the room, is one of a lot of reporters uh, waiting uh, to hear the latest bulletin, uh, believing that the president uh, is going to be all right, and certainly everything that we've heard uh, suggests that that is the case. But naturally, no one wants to uh, go beyond uh, the medical bulletins here or beyond what the doctors are uh, going to say to us because to do so would uh, perhaps be irresponsible and certainly might uh, open us uh, to the possibility that we would be wrong. Uh, we'll uh, let you know when uh, Lynn uh, comes in with the latest report. Back to you, Frank. All right, thank you very much, Sam. That is the center of attention right now, the uh, hospital, the George Washington University Hospital. As Sam said, they set up a jury-rigged uh, press room there. And we should have a briefing uh, fairly shortly. If they plan to do it about uh, 7 o'clock, they probably will come out to tell us that the president has been taken uh, out of surgery. We understand, Ted, that uh, uh, Mrs. Reagan, or preparations are being made for Mrs. Reagan to, uh, to spend the night there at the hospital. She went there, probably was there very shortly after he was there, uh, after the president arrived. She was told about it. And I just made the assumption earlier on that uh, probably in the car on the way to the hospital, he, yeah. he said somebody called Nancy. I don't know that that's true, but I'll, I'll bet it is. Right, so we can use the information and the Vice President, George Bush, uh, also, as of the last word that we had, and I assume he'll be there until the President is out of surgery, uh, which is supposed to happen momentarily. As you just heard Sam Donaldson say, Lynn Nofziger, the uh, President's close aide and old friend, is going to be briefing in just a few minutes, uh, 7 o'clock Eastern time, that's five minutes from now. Uh, and presumably he would not be coming down unless the president was out of surgery. The president went into surgery at 3.45 Eastern Time. That is a little more than three hours ago. Uh, everything that we uh, have been hearing from the hospital indicates that the president's condition is as good and as stable as is possible under the circumstances. Uh, and we spoke before, and, and I should point out that this doctor, and he would be the first to, uh, to make this point, is not on the scene, but a uh, former chief medical examiner from the city of New York with whom we spoke said if it's just what we've been hearing, that is the punctured lung and no other organs are involved, there is no reason at all why President uh, Reagan should not be fully recovered within, and these are the, uh, this is the time period he used, within seven to ten days. Uh, and he was particularly emphatic on the point that uh, the fact that the president is 70, 70 years old uh, is really no factor at all in what kind of a recovery he can make. So all of that, again, good news. We should uh, also remind you, uh, sometimes we've said these things so many times this afternoon and uh, this evening that uh, we forget them every now and then. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, the, the, the president actually walked from his car into the emergency room at the hospital at George Washington the University uh, here in Washington. He was not taken in on a stretcher, as were the others. He walked, and he cracked several jokes. As a matter of fact, we're told that as he was taken into uh, surgery, he looked up at the doctors and said, I hope you're all Republicans. And uh, he uh, reassured uh, Mrs. Reagan that he was going to be all right, and made several other quite uh, lighthearted uh, comments. He asked, uh, I guess he asked Mike Deaver or Ed Meese, who's minding the store, uh, when he saw them uh, all there. And, uh, so he was in uh, he was in a very good uh, frame of mind uh, he was uh, quite obviously concerned but he did not seem to be suffering from any uh, any immediate trauma at the time all right frank uh, we're going to switch out now to andrews air force base where our colleague uh, george Strait is waiting why are we going to andrews because george Strait was with vice president bush on the flight back from texas and george has remained out there george uh Bring us up to date, just chronologically. How did the vice president find out about it and, and uh, kind of take us through the afternoon from his vantage point, would you? Well, Ted, the first inkling that there was any trouble was when there was a sudden rush of activity among the Secret Service agents on board the vice president's plane while, we're, while we were still in Fort, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. 
In fact, the agents brought the vice president's first word of the shooting. We'd all just gotten on board Air Force Two in Fort Worth, Texas, after Vice President Bush had dedicated a hotel and then spoke to several cattlemen in a cattlemen's association. He was scheduled to go to Austin, Texas then and address the Texas state legislature in addition to talking to the Texas governor, William Clements. Well, on that flight to Austin, Texas, it was decided that Vice President Bush should return to Washington immediately. In fact, uh, the pilot said that the plane has never flown any faster than it did coming back from Austin. We did touch down in Austin just for a few minutes to refuel. Well, Vice President Bush, it seems, has not played any direct role in the decision-making processes that have been going on here in Washington. Instead, he's been on the phone almost constantly with his chief of staff, Admiral Daniel Murphy, with Secretary of State Haig and others who have been making the decisions here in Washington. When we got off of the plane, we were told that the vice president would first go to his residence, then to the White House, and then when he felt it was appropriate, or someone at the White House thought it was appropriate, then he would go to the hospital. That may have changed. Gentlemen? Yes, we understand that he's gone right to the hospital now. Isn't that true, Ted? Yes. Uh, the last word we got, George, was that the, uh, the vice president has already gone to the hospital. The, the interesting aspect now is that under this new arrangement that was made just last week, and, and indeed was announced by the White House, uh, the vice president is in charge of this crisis organization. Did he have anything to say about that on the flight back from uh, Texas, George? The vice president did not appear, uh, as he usually does, following him on the campaign and afterwards. He usually comes back and, uh, and talks to uh, the various members of the press who are, who are traveling with him. He didn't come back and talk to us at all. In fact, we were told that uh, right after he learned of the shooting, he wanted to be alone. He just sat in his compartment, collected his thoughts, thought of the responsibilities uh, that were then upon him and may uh, accrue to him. And then, uh, as described by various congressmen who were on the flight, Congressman Jim Wright, the majority leader, said that he's never seen George Bush more at ease, more calm, more in control of himself and his faculties and ready for the responsibilities that, uh, that uh, might uh, be in his future. So the mood on the, uh, the, mood on the plane then, George, was basically... Uh... Somber and uh, just waiting to see what happens. There were a lot of, lot of rumors, a lot of misinformation. Because the plane was flying so fast, their phones didn't work as well as they might. But uh, instead of taking any information from any of the news services, they were obviously in constant contact with the White House Situation Room. So the mood on the plane was somber, but yet hopeful, especially when they got the word that the president uh, indeed uh, uh, might be okay. All right. Well, George Strait, thank George. you very much indeed. And it should be pointed out that the president is apparently okay. At least the word that we are getting and the, the final bulletins have not yet come from the hospital. We should be getting word on that very, very shortly. Lynn Nofziger is supposed to be coming down uh, at the hospital to brief waiting reporters there. But all the information we've been getting is that the president, at least, is surviving this incident as well as can be expected. Yes, Ted, we have, uh, just to clear up one other uh, relatively minor point, uh, the vice president is not at the hospital, we're told. He is in the west wing of the White House, in the working quarters of the White House, probably in the Situation Room, I suppose. And he's going to wait uh, for some time before he goes to the hospital. I've just been told that uh, in my ear by sources that I have learned to trust that uh, Mr. Bush is actually at the White House right now. All right, we would like to go back now to Sam Donaldson, who is standing by uh, at that makeshift press room at uh, George Washington Hospital. Sam? Well, uh, Ted, we're here in the briefing room, and we've been told in about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, Lynn Nofziger and two of the surgeons will uh, come here and brief us. So that would suggest that the surgery is either over or almost over, although the person who gave us this information would not uh, confirm that. Uh, with me uh, is Barry Serapin, who does have some information about the surgery that uh, the president has undergone. Barry? Well, Sam, uh, the last I heard, which was about 20 minutes ago, uh, they thought he was going to be due out any time. Uh, we don't know much about it, but we do know they did some exploratory surgery to see whether or not there were any injuries to the abdomen. They apparently found none. Uh, I'm told by one source that, that uh, the bullet did hit the lower left lung uh, in Mr. Reagan's chest, but that he did well during the surgery. I'm also told that uh, they're setting up uh, quarters, in effect, so Mrs. Reagan can stay in the hospital and also Agent McCarthy's wife, and that agent also said to be doing well. As to uh, Jim Brady, uh, the press secretary, we've had all this confusion about his condition. Uh, I'm told, again, by a source in the hospital that uh, Jim Brady is on what this source describes as maximal support. Well, Barry, from the very beginning, 
fortunately, uh, all the signs have looked good. The president, for instance, walked into this hospital under his own power. He was assisted by two Secret Service agents who were holding him under each arm, according to an eyewitness who uh, told ABC News this. Uh, he was holding his left side. There was some blood coming down because his coat was open, according to the eyewitness, and they could see blood running down the left side. But he was conscious, he was talking, and he was walking. Not only talking, but chipper from all the quotes we've been getting. Do you have a few of them? Well, uh, to uh, Nancy Reagan, the honey I forgot to duck was uh, one of the quotes. To the doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. Those are the signs of a man who uh, seems to be uh, holding his own before he ever got to the operating table. Well, th we were told uh, by some sources that uh, an operation of this type could take anywhere from one to four hours. If it is indeed nearing its end or over, that would mean that it has taken something under three hours, something like that. Naturally, they would be uh, very careful and they would uh, do all of the repair that they felt they could under the circumstances. Well, we'll be back here at the briefing room in just a few minutes when Lynn Nofziger, the uh, special assistant of the president, one of his close friends, uh, briefs. And we are told two of the surgeons, presumably surgeons who have actually uh, participated in the operation, will be here to uh, answer questions then also. Back to you, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Sam, and thank you, Barry. We've had a, uh, a question come in from a viewer asking whether the president was wearing a bulletproof vest. Uh, to my knowledge, he was not, but uh, no way of knowing. There are many people, I suppose, uh, hard to understand, uh, but there, there may be many people around the country who are just learning of the uh, tremendous events of this day. It is now five minutes after seven o'clock on the east coast of the United States. And uh, for those of you who are at this point expecting to see our regular uh, evening news broadcast, we uh, will take a moment to, uh, to review the events of this day. At approximately 2.30 this afternoon, President Reagan was coming out of the Washington Hilton Hotel. After giving a speech to the Building Trades Council of the AFL-CIO, you will see the president come out very shortly now. This is slow motion tape of uh, his exit from the hotel. He comes out. He waves to the crowd across the driveway. Reporters call out uh, questions to him, as is their custom. You'll see him turn now and uh, look toward the reporters. Here's, and now, the shots in just a second. The agent in front of the president in blue suit is hit, falls to the ground. The president, although we didn't know it at the time, also was hit in the left side of his chest. The police who are swarming all over one man now are after a man who has been identified as John Warnock Hinckley. He will be arraigned later tonight. He is 25 years old, we understand now. Earlier we thought he was 22. The two men lying on the ground there. Well, now there is Agent McCarthy on the ground. Tim McCarthy. We are told that he is in uh, good condition at the same hospital where the president is now uh, in surgery. And our cameraman, Hank Brown, moves his camera back now once again to the uh, melee as they move in, the police and the uh, Secret Service agents, on the suspected assailant to uh, subdue him and make sure that he can do no further damage. I believe the camera will move. As I say, this is slow motion, but of course it all happened uh, within seconds after the uh, shots rang out. Four persons wounded, including the President of the United States. They're still struggling there with uh, this man known as John Warnock Hinckley. He had somehow moved into an area that was uh, reserved for the press, but he was not alone. Uh, we're told that there were other people there, other citizens. Now the man you see lying down there on the ground is Jim Brady, the president's uh, press secretary, who uh, was wounded in the head and is in uh, critical condition. He, too, uh, is undergoing surgery at uh, George Washington Hospital. The other two persons who were hurt, the uh, policeman from uh, the District of Columbia, John Villahanty, is said to be in uh, serious condition, and the agent, Tim McCarthy, is said to be in good condition. All right, Frank, we're going to take a look at uh, some pictures of John Warner Kinkley. This first one was taken back in 1972. It's his high school yearbook uh, picture. Uh, now another picture, somewhat longer hair, a little older, in 1974. He spent one semester at Texas Tech University. This picture was taken there. Uh, and then finally, a picture that was taken uh, just a couple of months ago in January of this year. 
uh, by the Colorado Highway Patrol. This is the picture from uh, Hinckley's driver's license. As you pointed out, he's 25 years old. Uh, earlier this evening, we uh, pointed out that he has apparently been arrested once before, although we don't know on what charge. And Frank, you were reporting uh, something that came to us from our affiliate in Dallas from WFAA yes. that apparently earlier, what was it, last year, uh, he bought in October. two, in October yeah. of last year, he bought two 22 caliber handguns for... Uh, $37 each, I believe it was. 37 or $47 so. each. $47 each. Uh, and it, it appears A that one of shot. those handguns uh, was the weapon that was used to uh, injure the president, his press secretary, Jim Brady, a Secret Service agent, and uh, uh, a veteran of the uh, District of Columbia Police Force. Just to bring you up to date again, uh, the president apparently coming out of surgery or should be out of surgery already. Uh, two of the surgeons who operated on him will be coming down to the makeshift press room at George Washington Hospital here in the District of Columbia to bring everyone up to date on what the president's condition is. Uh, apparently he has come through that surgery very nicely. Uh, the bullet hit him uh, on the left side of the chest, apparently puncturing his left lung. Uh, but it would appear that is the only damage that it did. There was some fear earlier on, and a viewer was kind enough to call in. I'd raised the question earlier, Frank, of why it was that a, uh, a small bullet can, in some instances, be more dangerous than a large bullet. I'm told that uh, low mass, low velocity causes the bullet uh, to kind of bounce around inside there and not exit uh, oh, as, as quickly or even as cleanly as a, uh, a larger or a higher caliber bullet. Uh, James Brady, the president's press secretary, not doing as well. He received a serious head injury uh, and I believe is also still in surgery. Uh, and the uh, Secret Service officer, whom you saw in that tape just a moment ago being hit, he was the man uh, who I think was closest to the president and apparently took one of the bullets that was uh, or may have been intended for the president. He is in good condition. The uh, police officer, however, is not in as good a condition. He is in serious condition. Uh, we should point out that uh, Frank uh, has been on the air since, what, shortly after 2.30, I About guess. 2.40, I guess. Uh, and the, word, yeah. the reason that we are remaining on the air live like this is because, of course, the story is still unfolding. For those of you who have been with us now for uh, four and a half hours or so, much of the information is repetitive, but you must understand that many people are just coming home from work, some people are just tuning in for the first time, uh, and we want to be sure that you know what it is we're talking about and that everyone be kept up to date on what the president's condition is. Uh, again, he's just coming out of surgery. The condition appears to be good. His press secretary, the condition not so good, serious head injuries, and the Secret Service agent and the police officer. Uh, the repetitive nature of it, I'm afraid, is essential. Staying on the air live is also essential because we want to be able to come to you with the very latest information as soon as it can be confirmed. You can imagine the disbelief with which people uh, who have been, let's say, at the beach or somewhere, uh, even away from a radio, uh, must be greeting this news as they hear about it now, that uh, several hours ago, the President of the United States actually was shot. We understand uh, from the FBI that uh, the suspected assailant, John Warnock Hinckley, will be arraigned tonight in uh, the U.S. District Court under the uh, Federal Officials Assassination Act, which is a relatively new law until uh, recent assassinations. Uh, murder was not a federal crime. Well, it is now if you murder certain officials or attempt uh, to do that, and that obviously is what has happened here. He is currently uh, held at the FBI office, and after the arraignment, he will be taken to what the FBI says is a secret location. I should imagine they'll keep a very close watch on him. Frank, we have uh, yet another piece of videotape that was done with an old friend of the president. This is a man who's been a friend of many presidents, uh, comedian Bob Hope. But in this case, the friendship goes back many years because these two men were out in Hollywood, of course, for years and years together and, and were friends long before President Reagan had any political ambitions whatsoever. But anyway, Bob Hope was contacted for his reaction to the shooting. We have that videotape now. I was with him uh, going to uh, in Peoria, the second last day of his campaign, and uh, I was riding in a car with him, and I said, I noticed you had that raincoat on in Detroit. He said, yeah, feel it. And I felt, and it was a flak jacket. And he said, the FBI insisted that I put it on because it's dangerous at this time of the election. Did he wear it regularly? Hmm? Did he wear it regularly? Well, I just saw him wear it two days. He didn't wear it the next morning. I don't know whether he wore a flak jacket. He was out in the in the stand in the street in front of 20,000 people in Peoria, and he was a good, sh you know, he was 
Uh, and in a tough spot right there if anybody wanted to knock him off. Well, well, that answers the question that that one viewer raised before, I guess, about the uh, flak jacket, the bulletproof vest. Uh, uh, was that during the campaign that he was referring to? Well, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure what uh, Bob Hope was talking about. Apparently during the campaign, but apparently he only wore it for a couple of days after he became president. Yeah. Yes, it was during the campaign. Was I it? Guess and then said. decided not to anymore. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the situation is this. It's 7.13 in the East, and we expect at uh, almost any minute now to have a uh, further report from the doctors who uh, performed the surgery on the president uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Reagan went into surgery shortly before 4 o'clock. Uh, whether he's actually come out of the operating room, we can't, be, uh, uh, we can't be certain, but we understand that they are going to come to the press room and to, uh, to give us a report of the surgery. All the indications we have had, uh, unofficial of course, is that the uh, president is uh, doing quite well. Uh, Senator Laxalt of Nevada, a very close friend of the president who went to the hospital immediately, uh, phoned Senator Baker oh, an hour and a half or so ago, I guess it was, Ted, and uh, said that he had been told by doctors that the president was doing very well and that they were very confident of uh, his complete recovery. And we've also been told uh, by uh, the former medical examiner of New York, Dr. DeMauro, who, as you pointed out, admittedly was not there, that it is not at all unusual for surgery of this nature to take so long. The president has been in there for three hours, and naturally there's concern about it. Uh, everybody would prefer that he'd been out in 15 minutes, but uh, surgery of this nature does apparently take some time. In, large, the... in large measure, Frank, because yeah. it is exploratory, and yeah. because they need to find out whether any of the other organs uh, have been damaged. Now, I suppose this is one of those situations where once you've opened that chest cavity, uh, they don't then want to have to open it again to find out later that they've missed something. So obviously they do it with, with great care. We're going to switch now to uh, White House correspondent Bill Greenwood, who is at the White House. Bill? The White House has just confirmed what we all knew, but have had a great deal of trouble getting confirmed, and that is that Vice President Bush is now here at the White House. His helicopter landed here about 7 o'clock, about 15 minutes or so ago. We were not allowed to see the vice president get off the helicopter. Enormous security precautions surrounded his return to the White House, and it was very difficult to, to get that confirmation that he indeed was aboard. The uh, gate, which links a street between the White House and the next-door executive office building, was locked shut so that reporters could not go on to the street and observe the vice president's arrival. That gate is still closed. The street is full of security agents. In the event the vice president wishes to go to his automobile, perhaps to drive to the hospital, he will do so under enormous security. Uh, it, it has never been uh, that tight in this reporter's memory, but uh, we have been told the vice president has gone to the Situation Room, which is on the ground floor level of the White House on a southwest corner of the building. In that room are four of the senior cabinet members, the uh, Attorney General, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, the Secretary of Treasury. They have been monitoring developments uh, back and forth from the hospital in the Situation Room, as well as uh, activities overseas from American adversaries to see if uh, anyone might try to take advantage of this situation, something that Secretary Haig said earlier had not happened and that he did not anticipate. With Mr. Bush now here in the White House, he will assume control of the Crisis Management Committee and uh, will be the man in charge, so to speak. The Vice President's office can, uh, will not say whether he intends to visit the hospital where Mr. Reagan is uh, being hospitalized and being treated about one mile from here, but one could expect that may happen once the President is out of surgery and out of uh, recovered from the anesthesia. Back to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Bill. Very concise report on what is taking place at the White House. Uh, really not very much, so far as we can tell, Ted. Uh, no, and, and, and perhaps an appropriate time to bring people up to date on something they may be wondering about, and that is what's going to happen to the Academy Awards. The uh, ABC's coverage of the Oscars, the Oscars themselves, I mean the Academy Awards, are being delayed by 24 hours. Uh, Hollywood showing great sensitivity in this regard to uh, the, uh, the nature of events today, and clearly it would have been unsuitable for that to unfold today, so it won't. It's been delayed by at least 24 hours, uh, so we will be able to stay with you live for as long as is necessary to bring you up to date on what is going on. And we have reason to believe that we're going to get some information uh, very shortly now because I was handed a note just a couple of minutes ago 
that said uh, five minutes until the hospital briefing. As uh, Sam Donaldson reported, uh, a couple of the doctors are expected to come down with Lynn Nostiger, who has more or less assumed the role of press spokesman there, uh, at the George Washington University Hospital to uh, brief reporters and the country on the condition of the president, who uh, has been in surgery for approximately three hours. The shooting occurred at 2.25, and the surgery, we understand, began at about 4 o'clock. Frank, let's go back to that 225 for a moment because our senior White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson, has recreated now the events uh, of the shooting itself. Let's go now to this report by Sam Donaldson. President Reagan had just finished delivering his speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel to the AFL-CIO Building Trades Union. He walked out the side door. Along with another reporter, I began to call to him about Poland, wanting to know what was new about Poland. He turned to us to the camera line and suddenly shots rang out immediately to my right and no, no farther than 20 feet from the president. Six shots were fired. Our cameraman, Henry Brown, turned his camera immediately to the assailant, who was uh, wrestled quickly to the ground by Secret Service agents and other law enforcement officers. The president, meanwhile, was grabbed by Secret Service men surrounding him and pushed into the limousine, his black automobile. Three people were on the ground, including Press Secretary Jim Brady, obviously shot. The uh, blonde uh, assailant, the suspect, was later identified as John W. Hinckley of Evergreen, Colorado. I did not immediately realize that President Reagan had been shot because he had a quizzical look on his face but showed no great pain as far as I was concerned. And yet another eyewitness on the scene saw it differently. Well, I was watching Reagan the whole time. And from what I saw, it was a combination of shock seeing his potential end right in front of his eyes you could see the feeling in his eyes so immensely it's a feeling i'll be forever printed on my memory the injured individuals including the president were brought to george washington university hospital several blocks away and shortly after they were brought in an eyewitness who just happened to be in the uh, operating room at the time because a relative of his was in the hospital described for abc news what he saw well at first when it first came up the uh Two ambulances came with a police car in between them. And then Mr. Riggins' car came in, and the Secret Service walked in and kept saying, get out, get out, get out. And everybody was looking to know what was going on. Then he told us to get the hell out. And we saw his gun, and everybody got up and started moving. Then by that time, when I got to the door, Mr. Riggins walked by, and I was close enough I could have shook his hand. Now, let's go back. Uh, was this walking in, was the president actually walking in under his own power? No, there was two uh, Secret Service on each side, and the president was holding his right, he was holding his left chest up on his arm. But he was not carried in. He was not on a stretcher. No, he wasn't on a stretcher.